Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Form Check Friday. If you haven't noticed, I'm Hello, sat friends. here with this very handsome man here. This is Dr. Seth Albersworth. If you haven't seen him on our channel, well, you should have. And uh, you should go check out his YouTube stuff. But anyways, um, yeah, Seth's gonna help us with our Form Check Friday this week. If you're not familiar with Form Check, basically we're taking your videos, we're gonna analyze them, we're gonna try to give you some tips and teach you or, or help you lift a little better. So let's uh, let's get into it. Dylan, what do we got up first here, man? First up, we have Ruby. Ruby, Ruby is from the UK. Okay. This was my last working set of deadlifts, so I was pretty fatigued. Okay. This is week two of the new Calgary Barbell Power Lifting, Power Building program, which, uh, where do you find that, Bryce? You can, uh, you can find that program in the Calgary Barbell app. If you go to calgarybarbell.com, click on app, you can sign up, big program library. And if you like form checks, we do them for you every week in the Discord. Ruby says she really struggles with front bracing and just general bracing. Okay. Her partner suggests she opens her hips more, toes and knees facing out more, uh, but she definitely feels strongest in the position in the video. Mm -hmm. Would love to get your opinion. Well, I think Seth, you got a pretty good, pretty good eye for bracing, and uh, I'm interested to hear your your opinion on this one. Well, I'm gonna say brace quality again. I'd agree that it isn't the greatest, just because we can see motion through the torso after the lift has initiated. If you look just above her belt, mm -hmm. you kind of see that little bit of crank forward, and from a pure force production standpoint, I probably would want to get rid of that. And in terms of everything else with hip position and the and the brace. I think that if she were to clean up bracing strategy, she probably could do more with the hips because if the spine is going bendy band, the hips aren't gonna be able to really drive the shoulders up because the torso is what connects your hips to your shoulders. Mm -hmm. And if the torso is bendy straw, the hips aren't gonna be able to produce force and direct, direct to the shoulders so the arms can pick up the bar. Right. <clears throat> so how do you, you said like if they, if, if she corrects her bracing strategies, what do you what do you recommend for that in terms of like her positioning? Like how would you cue this lifter well, if you had her in front of you? I probably wouldn't even start with a deadlift. I'd probably just go straight to can she brace? Period. Okay. And learning to brace is something that people make way, 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 way too complicated. And what I like to kind of break it down to is just, we're really just trying to contract everything around the torso as best as we can to make the thing as rigid as possible so we can have that force transfer. Right. And if we're gonna to try to teach it, what I usually get people to do is just take a breath in, feel expansion all the way around, and then just contract against that expansion. So like you're you're filling up the balloon and then you're flexing all of your muscles in against that balloon, and that should help her lock in a little bit better. And then once we kind of establish that in just like a static standing up, we can then try to transition that into the lifts. Okay. And like seeing this, I'm biased towards the top down deadlift setup. Mm -hmm. And I would probably suggest starting at the top, setting the brace, then going to the bar while maintaining that brace. And that'll give you an easier time at staying c connected or everything all together once you're already down there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like, I like a lot of that. Um, I think definitely, you know, starting from the, the fundamentals of bracing and, you know, getting the belt out of the way, getting the, the need of being at the bar out of the way is going to be a great way for you to kind of learn how to how to implement your bracing a little bit better. Um, you know, one thing that might help is once you've got that, go through some like sumo RDLs or something, right? Empty bar, start at the top with your brace, go down, see how far you can go before the brace starts to become more and more difficult to maintain. Um, in terms of like other cues, looking at your lift here, uh, what was the name again, Dylan? Ruby. Ruby, sorry. Uh, in terms of other things I'm seeing with your lift here, Ruby. Uh, I think that <clears throat> one of the reasons we might be struggling with some of the upper back tension uh, and, and connecting specifically this part of the brace down, um, I would definitely recommend trying some work without the belt. And not because I think you'll get stronger and your core will activate more or anything like that by removing the belt, but because I think sometimes the belt limits your proprioception. It limits your ability to feel your position and, and to be able to, to control some of those more fine positional muscles. And lastly, I think we might benefit from just gripping very slightly wider here. I think in some cases, if we're gripping a little too narrow, it can be harder and harder to get the shoulder blades 
into that depressed position. And what I mean by depressed is obviously the opposite of elevation, right? Elevation being shoulder blades up, depression being shoulder blades down. And I think that shoulder depression is not only gonna give you like the, the long arms, which is a cue that a lot of lifters will use, but it's also gonna limit your range of motion a little bit by doing so and allow us to, I think, get a little bit more out of the upper back and get a little less of this kind of being pulled forward off the floor. Absolutely. Right? And that's, yeah, that's what Seth's talking about there is as you come off the floor, if we watch really closely here um, in these couple of frames, right, as you come up, camera shifts a little bit, but you can see there we do get pulled forward more and we start to see more and more flexion in here, which means this isn't as rigid as we need it to be. And once we got the brace sorted, once we got the upper back stuff sorted, kind of what we can think about to like enhance star position, enhance wedge is you're trying to like link the upper back to the brace almost. And like we're using the lats to pull forward. We're using the abs to pull hips forward. We're using the glutes to push hips forward and put all that together. Star position is gonna look a lot prettier. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the other advice you've gotten, I actually would, I would say that this stance width and toe angle probably is gonna be the one that suits you best. I don't know that I would have you toe out. Well, maybe based on the fact that your foot's lifting and you're kind of out on the outside of your foot, maybe towing out a bit or widening slightly. But I don't necessarily think that, you know, widening the knees and opening the hips and all that kind of stuff is gonna be the cue. I think it's gonna come more from your bracing and I think your hip height is probably gonna be pretty solid if we can get a still yeah. frame. Yeah. So that's about where we're starting to lift, hip height wise. And I think if our brace was in a slightly better place here, that would be a totally, uh, like a great starting position even for you. Yeah, and like the foot, the foot pressure thing, it might solve itself as soon as you get the brace dialed. Mm -hmm. But if you still can't keep the big toe down, if you're still rolling outside, like Bray said, toe out a little bit, could get you have, let you have a little bit better foot pressure and produce a little bit more force. Cool. Hope that helps, Ruby. We're gonna get on to the next lifter here. Dill, what do we got? All right, next up, we have Mitchell. Mitchell says, right, Mitchell. good day, guys. Good day. Training for my first equipped meet in right. just under a month. Just got my hands on the Super Centurion. Feels like I just can't hit depth on the third squat. I pushed it a bit harder, but then it feels like the suit is pulling me uh, out of my brace. I don't know if, it's, if I just need to go heavier, faster, or the suit isn't seated properly. Got on just a crossfire style belt because I got too fat to brace properly with my Inzer belt. Mm. And that's what we got from Mitchell. Okay, so a couple things. Number one, if these are squat stands and they're freestanding, right? If they're separate from one another, narrow them up a little bit. Because you can see on this walkout, and I think that's one of the first things that like kind of shakes your confidence a little bit, is that you're walking out and you catch, I think, both sides of the rack. So. If you can, narrow the rack slightly so you're not catching it when you're walking out. What I was wondering first is, what weight are you putting the suit on at? Because mm. this looks pretty heavy. This looks like it's challenging pretty much everything, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because obviously if we're trying to put weight on the bar, we want to put weight on the bar. Mm -hmm. But a big mistake that I made way back in the day when I was first getting into single ply is like I would work up to something heavy raw and then I would put the suit on after I already worked up to something heavy raw. So like my first suit set was near raw max and then there was so much going on that I had no idea where I was in time or space and it just turned into something absolutely disgusting. <laughs> and my biggest recommendation for people getting into gear is put the stuff on in your training session way, way, way earlier than you think you need to. Like if you were to put the suit on at three reds and just feel it out, feel the groove, feel the pressure with three reds, that way you're not worried about weight on the bar, you're not worried about if you're strong enough to support it, you can just focus on learning the suit, learning the groove and learning to push into it. And when I was at my peak multiply days, like everyone always wants to say, oh, you need more weight to hit depth. And I'd argue, no, you just need to be better at pushing into the suit because the same suit that I hit 1102 in, I was able to hit depth with 405. So if you can get good enough at manipulating the gear, feeling the gear, knowing where to go in the gear, the weight on the bar shouldn't be that much of a problem in terms of like being able to get down there. And right now, this to me looks like it's just too heavy for you to really feel where the suit tension is. It's too heavy for you to really 
know where to go and it looks like you're just not trusting it. So I would say next time you're in the suit, put it on way earlier, feel it out, be patient with it, push into it, feel the pressure, go towards the pressure because that pressure is what's gonna give you support and that should give you a way better time as weight goes up on the bar. And later on in your career, once you have the suit handled, you don't wanna just start at you know three reds with the suit on because you still want to get some raw training stimulus in, but Right now, if the goal is to learn the suit, just put her on early in the workout, make yourself get down there, make yourself hold position, make sure the suit is stretching and flexing and that you're not bending to get down there. And that's gonna make this look a whole lot prettier just if you take the time to warm up with it and get used to it. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think Seth pretty much knocked it out of the park there. That was a, a dissertation in, uh, in learning equipment. Uh, the other thing I was gonna say in regards to the walkout was just, Try to ensure that when you're taking steps back, you're not twisting your torso. Because even on a comp standard rack, if you're taking a big step and your whole torso is going out on an angle, you're still gonna run into the uprights. And if you have 120, 130% of your raw max on your back and you run into those, that's really gonna throw you off. Often, once you get good at single ply, once you get a little more experienced with it, the walkout is going to be one of the most challenging parts of the lift, without a doubt. If you're single ply, you're competing IPF where you have to walk out. Um, yeah, I, again, I'll just kind of echo what Seth said. Putting the suit on earlier is a fantastic strategy. You know, I think my first equipped session that you were there for, you were wrapping my yeah. knees. Um, and actually Seth, you know, gave me a lot of insight early on, which I think contributed to my being successful in equipment. Um, but like my first equipped session, I had a, I was a 315 raw squatter, I squatted 315 kilos. And my first equipped session, I squatted 302, pretty much to depth. And I think the expectation that you put on the suit and then all of a sudden you're just like, you can't go at raw numbers or below uh, is, is a common misconception. The other thing I'm gonna say is the belt. You know, having a stretchy belt like that in equipment, I think is, is gonna make things tough. You want a robust, stiff belt that's gonna help hold things in position. Um, lastly, I'm not sure if you have any room on these straps, but if these straps have been taken in, I would take the seams back out so that they're at their full length. I think it's gonna be way easier to learn a squat suit without the straps, super tight. The straps being really tight is gonna essentially do what you were talking about, where you feel like it's pulling you out of position, pulling you into flexion, rounding you out. When you get good, you learn to use that kind of pressure between the hip and the strap, which essentially goes like this, you learn to use that to keep you super well braced, you know, neutral, maybe even slightly extended. But when you're early, that's just gonna pull you into flexion, round you out, and it's gonna make your squat feel like poo poo. And so, sorry, go ahead. Right. Um, uh, yeah. And something else with the straps is, what I used to do with straps up is I would, when I was getting set up, I would grab the strap and like almost roll myself back and roll mm -hmm. myself back. Mm -hmm. And that way the strap is almost holding me in more extension. And then once the bar was there, I could turn my brace on, get locked in. And there was no way it would ever move just because there was so much tension from the straps, so much tension from my brace. And that way the suit will almost hold you up more than it'll try to dump you forward. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But last thing before we mm -hmm. get off yeah. this guy. If you got more, let's, on the let's walkout, go. Your knees are pretty soft and it looks like that the knees being so soft through the unrack, knees being so soft through the walkout, it's making it hard for you to get really stacked in a good position after you're already out there. And again, I think that that can be solved just by putting the suit on earlier, figuring out how to walk out strong with less weight just so it's not such a shock. Mm -hmm. And that should just make everything else look prettier underneath. Very lastly. <laughs> We're just ripping on it. This, the re-rack is concerning right you're you're standing up and then you're just kind of falling forward and it looks like we almost do miss this jacob like we're close to not getting back in on that left side right you're under it you hit the front of it and then it just kind of barely gets up over make sure that if you don't have like number one if you're equipped lifting you should have a spotter somebody even if it's even if it's just like a partner a friend somebody just like nearby who can call for help if like the worst happens, that's better than nothing. Um, I see you got some boxes here, that's great. Hopefully they're robust enough that they could take a, you know, four or 500 pound bar falling on them. 
Um, but definitely, you know, take the time to learn to walk it back in. Make sure that bar is set. And like, if you need to bring these down one, uh, there was a period of time in my equipped lifting where I was using a lower rack height because by the time I got that bar unracked, it was so much more than my raw squat. Even like the stiff bar was bowing a little bit and you get under there, you pick it up, it bows a little bit more. It makes the walkout tougher. So bringing your rack height down between your equipped and raw squat, even with the same bar position on your back can sometimes be a play. And I have put the bar back in under the hooks in equipment before, and it was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. It was in a barn. My brother and I were the only ones home on the farm, and I put it under the hooks. He was back spotting me. He didn't realize I was under the hooks, and he didn't understand why I was panicking so much. He was just <laughs> confused. And then uh, yeah. I, I ended up dumping it off my back. It clipped him in the knees. It was a big freaking mess. Like, thankfully, we, I had spotting straps in the power rack, so it didn't mm. go all the way down, and like, it didn't end him, but Definitely yeah. avoid that if possible. Be safe. Yes. Be safe. Learn from my mistakes so you don't do them yourself. <laughs> All right. What do we got next here, Dill? Next up, we have Daniel. Greetings from Germany. Guten Tag? Uh, is that, is yeah, that it? I think you might be right. I was going to say hola. I was going to say I'll feature saying, but I think that's goodbye. Or maybe that's just a weird word they made up for the sound of music. I am strength training on and off for a couple years, but I'm now more serious and consistent for the last year. I noticed that while deadlifting, it pulled forward and feel that my lower back gets very tired and tight the day after. I'm guessing it has to do with my starting position, but I'm not sure. Any help would be greatly appreciated. So I think the biggest thing I'm seeing here is that number one, I, I honestly love a lot of what you're doing. Um, I'm jealous of his levers. Yeah, Very. yeah, you got a nice like nice low lockout. You know what I mean? Um, your your lockout position. If I can get a stop on the right frame, there you go. Uh, that's great. Like you've got nice long arms. You have some good natural leverage to be a good deadlifter. The first thing I notice is that we really snap into position. Like you violently pull those shoulder blades down as you go into you know kind of pulling the slack out and getting the pull started. I think you can ease into that a little bit more, try to find that tension and then start the pull. You know, you don't have to slow it down. You don't have to be any less aggressive, but I think just being a little bit more controlled with how you're setting the shoulders, it's gonna give you more consistency. And the next thing I'm gonna say is with the low back kind of feeling like it's overly tired, make sure that as that bar comes across the knees, we're thinking about driving from the hips because you actually have a phenomenal position. Like I'm not, I'm, I don't think that we're like going through a lot of flexion extension and that's why we're getting, you know, extra fatigued in the back. I think we might just be thinking more about pulling back with the back than we are about pushing through and locking with the hips, right? So as soon as that bar comes across the knees, like we're thinking hips and hamstrings, we're thinking, you know, squeeze your butt and get your hips through to extension. Yeah. What are you seeing, Seth? And something that'll help with that is with longer limb guys, I've had success getting them to stiff leg into their wedge. And what I mean by that is when you're on the bar, push to the floor, get tension in your quads, kind of push your hips up a little bit. And then once your hips are up and you're like in the position you would be in on a stiff leg deadlift, like even a little bit more pushed up, more tension than this, because you're just kind of there right now. Like really push into that, push the hips up. And then once your hips are up, try to squeeze your glutes to shove your knees forward and keep that quad tension as you're doing it. And that'll let you have more tension that'll make the wedge more fluid. And you probably won't feel as much need to kind of jerk into the initial set. Yeah. Very much the opposite of kind of what we were cueing the, the first lifter, yes, right? Where yes. you were saying that she was a good candidate for a top down setup, yep. where she's setting her brace and then going to the bar. In this case, we're saying you almost, you kind of do it there actually. Yeah, it's, like kind, you, it's kind of there, but it's, it's not deliberate. It's just like kind of kick back. Yeah. He's just going to that position and it doesn't look like he's creating tension there. And like when you're here, I want you to like actually think about like trying to pull the bar up and like, like you would initiate a stiff leg. Well, we, we obviously don't want to actually stiff leg it, but if we can have that tension, that's gonna help us get set so we can maintain that set once we're actually in position to pull. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think we do get like a little bit shy almost on some of these lockouts, which is part of what makes me think we're, we're trying to do a lot of the lockout work with just the back, right? So we come up and I think by about this rep, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you're just getting back extension and then you're calling that like kind of a done rep. Whereas what I would like to see is way more hip extension. Maybe not way more, but like- Squeeze them butt cheeks. Finish, finish the hip extension. 
Um, and this, you know, to me, I can see that we're in hip extension still, and we're going from a very slightly flexed back position, which I think is, is actually fine and dandy for you, um, to a more extended back position, and then that's the end of our rep, right? So that tells me that in your head, you're like, well, if I get my back straight, then we're finished the rep. Where in actuality, it should be, if you have that little bit of flexion, that little bit of flexion can stay, we're looking for hip extension, right? We're looking for you to squeeze your butt and get your hips all the way through at the top. Absolutely, and accessory that I like to use to kind of teach what that should feel like is 45 degree back raise. Think about just squeezing your butt and just shove your hips through the pad, and that's gonna be kind of what your deadlift should feel like in the glutes at lockout. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I think even, even some RDLs or something like that, like light RDLs as you're warming up to just practice the top end of the range of motion in the hinge, um, be another good one. You can see our biases with our accessory work selection. <laughs> maybe, maybe a conjugate guy wants to do all the weird shit, but just wants to do all the noble stuff. And yeah, it's like, I don't know, keep it more specific, maybe. I'm, I'm going to say that both are going to work. Yes, it's for just, sure fits into preferences, fits into programming style. And like, if you're someone who succeeds with more barbell work, listen more to Bryce there. If you're someone that likes weird accessories, try my shit out. Yeah, it's just things that are like a little bit more removed from uh, from the specificity. But again, yeah, I don't think it's that one's wrong and one's right. It's more like just kind of different ways of getting at the same thing. Who's this, Dylan? Or Daniel could just do some bicep curls and do it my way. Yeah, you, know? you could do it Dylan's way, and biceps will solve all. It will solve everything. Deadlift, get, bench, squat, can't did, go did, wrong. Did we get two equip lifters in one form check? Is this yep. real? Yep. Wow, I that's think, great. I think this episode was intended to have Danny here because she's training for an equipped meet. Mm. Um, but Danny right now is a Danny's little bit sick. unfortunately sick. So we have Seth, and Seth is an equip lifter, so I mean it ends up working out. Was. Mm -hmm. Was it yeah, was yeah. an equip lifter? Don't group me into that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Seth has been very successful in equipment before. He knows his way around. He taught me a lot of what I sort of built on when I first started in equipment, and that was single ply, which you also did a not, hell of a lot of. Not as successfully. Pretty successfully. Moderately successful. Yeah, but. This is pretty. I like this. I this, like a lot of this. This is Braylon, by the way. Yeah. And Braylon just says, looking for general tips on single ply squats. Okay. The only thing I really don't like is your breathing up. Yeah, that mm -hmm. hand forward shrug mm -hmm. when you're taking your breath. And the only reason I don't like that is like, obviously we need to expand rib cage to take air. Yeah. But if we're shrugging with that and moving the head, we're sacrificing some degree of upper back tightness, which when it gets really heavy, it could come back to bite you. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a few lifters who have really had a preference for that kind of like shrug as they take their breath. And it's taken me a while to kind of get some of those lifters out of that. But once we got them out of that habit, and they got more consistent and feeling good with, you know, taking their brace without altering their upper back position, it's led to much, much more consistency. Another thing I'm noticing here is that it looks like your spotter is like helping you out of the rack here a little bit. And when the spotter lets go of the bar, it, it seems like it goes a little wonky on you and you have to like take a second to settle it, right? So he lets go and then all of a sudden the bar's like, whoa. Um, so if the spotter's doing that, and maybe this is somebody you hadn't communicated with ahead of time, or uh, maybe somebody who's, who's a little newer to equipped lifting, uh, it looks like this lifter might even be doing the same thing. But yeah, don't let them help you out of the rack. It's probably just gonna throw you off more than anything. Um, I can't recall right now, there might be some obscure rule where you can actually get a handoff. I was gonna squats. say, I, I remember in the IPF rule book somewhere, Something like years like, ago, there was a rule where you can get assistance out of the rack. Yeah. But I think that any assistance that you would gain is gonna be negated by the sketchiness of it. Yeah. And the problem with that in a meet is like, it's not gonna be the same guy spotting you in the gym and mm -hmm. trying to coordinate a three-man squat lift off <laughs> is going to be exceptionally difficult mm -hmm. if there are spotters who aren't used to it and like in the groove with you as yeah. you're walking out. Maybe the rule is that you could get sides to help hand off on the bench. I don't I don't think so. I don't know. That's a lot of multiply. I can't remember. I can't remember. Even three man handoff on bench and multiply meets is terrifying if the people aren't in sync and I've had some very, very, very <laughs> sketchy scenarios with that. Yeah. I think the funniest one if I'm about to tell stories. 
Yeah, sure. In the back room at one of the hybrid meets, I was giving liftoffs for Julius Maddox, giant, giant man, giant bench, and 700 my, some raw. Maybe? Yeah, I think close Six, to eight. 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 eight there, there you go. I don't yeah. know if he's actually broken eight yet. Massive just bencher, anyways. Disgustingly strong. And I was giving the lift off in the warm up room, and I just called size butters over because it was like a 675, and I just wanted, in case something got screwed up, I wanted people there to help catch it. And the, one of the side spotters thought that we were doing a three bed handoff. So mm. he picked up really freaking hard. The other guy didn't at oh. all. And we almost killed Julius Maddox before he could bench. So <laughs> didn't they misload his bar too? Yeah, they, was that they, the same yeah, meet? Yeah, they did the same meet they misloaded oh. him. So he, he had a bad time. It's, it's partially <laughs> my fault. That's rough. Um, and, and honestly, uh, Braylon, one of the reasons that we're just like reminiscing and telling stories right now is because your squad itself is fantastic. Right, if you can if you can be consistent with this technique and your squats look like this all the way up, you're doing great. Yes. Right, like you've got nice short femurs, long torso. You're able to maintain like a pretty decent amount of extension even through the squat, which for most people doesn't really work because they can't get to depth. But it looks like you're able to get to depth with that relatively consistently, and it doesn't. You know, we don't we don't see that little bit of rocking in the pelvis that often throws people for a loop when they come out of the bottom uh, trying to stay extended like that. So, yeah, it just kind of looks like you're built for this lift and you're doing a, a pretty great job of it. Might be a little, a little excessive on the knees out here on rep rep two, maybe. I think like one last thing we're gonna really nitpick stuff is is he wearing socks or is he in shoes? It looks. Looks like just socks. And I'd say like, that's probably not the biggest deal, but on meet day, you Lack have to- Lack of specificity. You have to wear shoes and ground contact is so important. So I would just make sure that you're used to having shoes on your feet. Yeah. But that's minor detail, easy fix. Well, if we're gonna get into nitpicking here, uh, let's keep let's keep that bar a little, a little tighter at lockout here, right? It looks like you're putting more into it than you need to. And that bar is like lifting and bouncing around on your back. Like there's no no need for that, and I think if anything, at some point with uh, you know, a hundred plus percent, that's gonna really throw you off, right? Especially if you're trying to do multiple reps, right? And then you're having to adjust your foot. We're going again. Second rep, I think we cut a little high-ish, a little on the line, maybe not quite as confident on rep two there, but yeah, I think the the weight bouncing around between reps to me on the squat is, I had a competitor, I think, try to use that one time in the warm up room to like psych me out. Um, Did it work? No, I beat him. Uh, this was like years and years and years ago when I was like, when it was like the battle for provincials back in uh, whatever, 2014, 2015. But. And I think the bar bounce too, that kind of ties back into what we're saying in the beginning with the shrug breath. Like if you're mm -hmm. not, locked down, the shoulder blades aren't attached to the body, that's gonna make it more easy to have that bar whip bounce at lockout just because you're not pulling it into yourself, you're not connecting to it. Yeah, but man, other than that, you got a great squat and uh, hope you hope you stick with it. Yeah, I, I'm impressed. Yeah. All, All right, right our, one more? Our final submission, yes, one right. more. This is Nat, or maybe it's Nate, I don't know, just N-A-T. Uh, I'm not sure if I wedge enough into the bar. I feel pretty comfortable at my hip height, but should I set my hips lower? I also used to sumo as my comp lift, but now it's just as an accessory because my adductors sometimes act up. Any other tips would be very helpful. Thank you. All right. I think I like the, the hip height. Mm -hmm. Just because it doesn't look like it's getting in the way and like yes, it is a little bit stiff-legged mm -hmm. But it is working very 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 well with your levers I agree. So I don't think that that necessarily needs to change yeah. and like The wedge might be softer than how someone like myself wedges into a conventional But again, I think it is working with you and you're still creating a ton of tension as you go to the bar So I'm pretty okay with both the hips both the wedge and there is kind of like the whole anti-wedge trend now, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you're kind of like doing that in a way that is productive because mm -hmm. like the, the wedge, the slack pull is just part of your pull and it looks very fluid. Yeah, yeah, it looks smooth, looks solid. Uh, I'm definitely with Seth, I like, your, I like your wedge, I like your hip height, I think you're coming off the floor well. But when it gets to about, like just below the knees, there's some funkiness going on, so. 
I think we're getting really close to full knee extension as the bar's at the knees, which I think is putting you pretty far out on your toes um, and, and leading to like an abnormally slow lockout where we're kind of like fighting to stay balanced. Um, I think similar to our one of our previous lifters here, I think we're trying to do a lot of the lockout with the back. I think we could bias a lot more hips coming through as we start to get stuck, but that's also gonna come hand in hand with keeping a little bit more heel pressure. Because I think what happens here is we almost slammed a full knee extension and we're, we're really far out of the center of gravity, right? As soon as the knees go to extension, like we're getting pretty far pulled forward. So I would say slow down the knee extension a little bit, get those hips going as it comes up to the knees. And I think that's gonna even out the, the, like the strength curve a little bit better, right? It's gonna smooth out that sort of more exaggerated slow lockout. Absolutely. And I think, I think you do a better job of it on the second rep here. But. And this actually reminds me a lot of Darrell's deadlift and how it looks and how it used to look before he made some changes kind of in the line that Bryce was talking about. And kind of what he did to kind of finish up the technical cues that Bryce is giving is he just hammered the crap out of slightly rounded stiff legs with a belt on. He hammered the crap out of dimmel deadlifts to really nail down that top end on the dimmels, nail down the being able to pull through with spine and hips at the same time on the stiff legs. And that made his mid range look a whole lot cleaner. So those are two accessories you could give a whirl on, but like overall, like I'm, I'm very, very stoked with this deadlift. Yeah, yeah, again, like good leverages. I think really good start position. Um, and yeah, I think if we can clean up that lockout a little bit, uh, one of the things that I might recommend in terms of like accessories and, and variations would be maybe like a high-ish pause deadlift and or like if you pause there and then restart the pull because that's about where we're starting to see things go a little funky on you. If you pause there, restart the pull, I think we're gonna get a bit better organization and, and really kind of hammer that top end. The other thing that I'd recommend um, is is some, some bands and or chains. Absolutely. Get a little bit of accommodating resistance on there, make that lockout stronger, uh, uh, harder, and, and you'll make it stronger. And I was giggling again because like the, the high pause deadlift is just the dimmel with the bottom half. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so again, different ways go. to skin a cat. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it, hey Dill? Yep. All right, well, Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, if you like this content, make sure to like and subscribe and make sure that you head over to Dr. Seth Albersworth. We'll put a link to his YouTube channel in the description. He's putting out YouTube content daily right now. Daily. Daily. It's fun. He's got a lot of stuff to say. And as you can tell, he's smart and handsome. And I gotta catch up to this guy on YouTube, so. <laughs> well, we're doing our best. All right, bye everybody. See ya.